You know, this last week I was just thinking how blessed I am. And I was thanking God. I just said, Lord, you, I, am, I am so, I, I am so, I'm a blessed man. I'm so blessed. Lord, you have blessed me. And the Lord didn't need to speak audibly, but he said to me the following. He says, well, you've blessed me. I said, well, how have I blessed you? You know, I'm, I, I'm a complainer. I'm, I'm stubborn. I'm proud. I, I know none of you are. I'm talking about myself here. And he said, well, and he started to just bring to my remembrance just little things. When you did that, that blessed me. That blessed me. When you, when you did that, that blessed me. I think about when it comes to the children. And when Jesus said, such is the kingdom of heaven made of these. And how much of a blessing it is to him when we bless the least of these. I would say that the Lord would say, you're blessing me. Yes, I blessed you, but all the work you are doing and have done was a blessing to me. And I believe we have treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thief cannot break in and steal. And we will never see it until we're up there with him. And then he'll show us. When you did that, there's the reward. There's the treasure. Because you took the time to do that. What a blessing to me it was. Enter in. Well done. Good and faithful servant. God is so good. And I thank God for what he did through this fellowship. As small as we are. I feel like we were a Gideon-sized army, right, Rene? The, you guys so tirelessly, and I mean, it just—it's amazing to me. I think, I think God. You know how we we would pray, Lord, when you're searching the earth to and fro. You know, your eyes are throughout the earth to and fro, looking for hearts fully devoted to you, so you can be strong on their behalf. I think when you did that, you know, worldwide search, and He doesn't use Google; doesn't have to. Uh, he found us. He found this little obscure fellowship called Calvary Chapel Caneo, and he said, they have a heart for me, a heart fully devoted to me. I can be strong on their behalf. You know, God's never really looking for ability. He's looking for availability. And when we give him our availability, then he gives us the ability. And I think that's what we've uh, seen here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joey, for coming up and, and sharing. Okay, we're in the book of Leviticus. We've been going through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We started in Genesis. We made it through uh, Exodus, and we are in Leviticus. And so if you can turn there at this time and uh, get ready. It is a short chapter. It won't be a short teaching, so you're not going to get off that easy. <laughs> Both Leviticus 17 and 18 deal with how the uh, Israelites were to offer their sacrifices and their worship to God. Uh, God is now going to instruct them on how he wants to be worshipped. See, the problem is the Israelites had embraced the practices of the pagan nations around them. Uh, this is really all they knew. Now think about this, that uh, they had been in slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. So uh, these Israelites, that's all they knew. They were born in slavery. This is the first time they've ever uh, seen anything or experienced anything outside of Egypt. So all they knew was all they knew and what they had learned when they were in Egypt. And what they learned in Egypt were the practices of the pagans. How that they would offer their sacrifices to the demonic gods and goddesses. And remember now, the Egyptians had plenty gods, <laughs> plenty goddesses. And the way that they would worship these gods, with a little g, was very sexual and very musical in its nature, in the way that they would worship. And so this is what God is now going to instruct them on 
And he's going to teach them, really show them, and even command them how it is that he desires to be worshipped. It's only been really less than a year since they had uh, been delivered out of Egypt. So now that the Israelites are out of Egypt, God has to get the Egypt out of the Israelites. Now, I know you know that in typology, Egypt is a type of the world. So too, as the Israelites were delivered out of slavery from Egypt, we're delivered out of slavery from sin, you see. So Moses was their deliverer. Moses, a type of Christ. Jesus is our deliverer. So Egypt is a type of the world. And is that not true how it is for me and you when we come to Christ? Now, we've come out of the world, but now the Lord has to get the world out of us. And that's essentially what he's doing here with the Israelites. See, still fresh in their minds was the demonic worship of the golden calf. Now, the golden calf was an Egyptian god. You know, it's interesting to me that whenever there's an archaeological dig and they find some relic from some ancient, you know, uh, civilization, you know where they go to authenticate it? The Book of Mormon, of course. (laughs) That was pretty bad, wasn't it? Of course they don't go to the Book of Mormon. You know why? In fact... You know, there's no archaeological find whatsoever that would document or authenticate anything that is written in the Book of Mormon. These secular scientists, you know where they go? They go to the Bible. That's how they authenticate an archaeological find. And this was the case. And the New York Times a while back had an article about this golden calf from 1550 B.C., that was unearthed. And they uh, said, quote, historians and archaeologists believe it was the animal, this golden calf, that was the object of worship, the central object of worship. Because see, the calf represented their deities. Remember now, the Egyptians had frog gods, Uh, No relation to Farag. That's a whole different... uh... (laughs) My dad was Egyptian and Farag is an Egyptian name, but no relationship. But they worshipped the the flies. They worshipped the the insects. And that's why when the plagues, when God sent the plagues, what God was doing was he was saying, uh, you like to worship frogs, do you? Have some frogs. <laughs> he was showing his supremacy over their gods, their false gods. And see, now this is what God's doing. He's saying to Israel, I want you to worship me in a way that is worthy of how I am to be worshipped. What's the theme of Leviticus? Holiness. I am a holy God. And when you worship me, you do not worship me. As the Egyptians worship their gods, you worship me as the true and living God. And that's what this chapter and really the next chapter in chapter 18 are about. So let's pray. Ask God to bless this to our understanding as we get into his word. If you would join with me. Verse 1. Lord, we need for you by your Holy Spirit to be our teacher tonight. Lord, we need for you to give us eyes to see what it is that you want to show us tonight. Lord, we need for you to speak by the Holy Spirit in that still, small voice. Lord, we need for you to minister to us. Lord, give us understanding. Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to Aaron, to his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people. Verse 5, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting to the priest and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the Lord is saying, this is not only how I want to be worshipped, this is where I want to be worshipped. You cannot worship me wherever you want, in any way you want. You cannot approach me on your own terms. The way you approach me will be exactly this way and in this place. And if you do not, you will be cut off from the people. God takes the worship of Him very seriously And he's going to give the Israelites the instructions and the commands as to how it is in the newly built tabernacle that he will receive their worship of him. Verse 7, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons. What? They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons. You mean the Israelites were involved in demonic or satanic devil worship? Yes. It goes on to say, after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. Also, verse 8, you shall say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. Again, This is how I want to be worshipped. This is the way I want to be worshipped. This is where I want to be worshipped. And I will forbid you from continuing to worship demons as you have heretofore. You bring it to the tabernacle. You bring the sacrifice to the Lord. It has to come to and through the high priest. And you're going to stop worshipping demons Or if you continue to worship in the way that the Egyptians worshipped, you will be cut off from your people. Verse 10, And whatever man of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell among you, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore, verse 12, I said to the children of Israel, No one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hurts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. Verse 14, for it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. And, verse 15, every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beasts, whether he is a native of your own country or a stranger, He shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Then he shall be clean. But, verse 16, if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. And that's the end of the chapter. Let's close in prayer. Aren't you glad you came to Bible study tonight? What a great chapter. I know you can't wait to go and Write one of these verses and put it up on your refrigerator as a life verse. I mean, what in the world? What, what could this possibly 
mean to me? How does this chapter apply to me? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The Lord is addressing the pagan practices of the people because they were involved in certain satanic rituals. Well, pastor, you're, you're talking to the, the church here. We're, we're believers. Surely that's, uh, that's not what we're doing. Really? You may not be drinking blood, are you? But you might be offering sacrifices of pagans to demons. Possibly. The fact of the matter is, is that Satan worship is very much alive in our day today. Now, it may not come in the form of a golden calf, but it could come in the form of a platinum album. Let me explain. This is why I wanted to get only this chapter tonight. The last time I taught through the book of Leviticus, I took 17 and 18 together, but I really sensed that the Lord had a word tonight that he wanted spoken. Lucifer was one of three archangels. When he was cast out of heaven, that's why a third of the angels were cast out with him. Because each of these archangels, Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael, each had a third of the angels under them as archangels. Now, it's believed that you had a messianic angel, you had a militant angel, as he's called, and then you had the musical angel. It's been said that Lucifer was the worship leader of heaven. He was the angel of the harp or the angel of music. Consider what the prophet Isaiah said when speaking of him in the 14th chapter, verse 11 through 15. Your pomp, speaking of Lucifer, is brought down to Sheol, and the sound of your stringed instruments, stringed instruments, your stringed instruments, Lucifer, the maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. See, what happened was, Lucifer, as the worship leader, became proud. And he exalted himself. And he wanted the worship for himself. Satan from the beginning has always desired to be worshipped. And he does get his worship now, here on earth, when he was cast down to the earth. Ezekiel 28, 13 says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, musical instruments, was prepared for you on the day you were created. Because, Lucifer, you were created to worship. I'm about to make a statement that I'm, I'm sure maybe most, I hope, if not all of you are familiar with, but... Do you realize that you and I were created to worship God? Do you realize that when we're with Him for all eternity, you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be worshiping Him for all eternity. My goodness, are we ever going to get tired? No way. 
The creations are before the throne day and night, singing, worshiping Him, worthy, worthy, worthy. He's going to be worshipped. We're going to worship Him. He created us to worship Him. I'm going to take it a step further. You and I have to worship. We have to because that's how we are wired. That's how our Creator created us. He created us to worship. You're all familiar with that Bob Dylan song. You got to serve somebody. It's either the, you know, it's either God or it's the devil. But you've got to worship somebody. You're either going to be worshiping God or you're going to be worshiping the devil, but you're not going to be worshiping both. You cannot. You cannot serve two masters. You'll either serve the one and hate the other. But you cannot. Jesus did not say you should not. It's a good idea if you did not. No, he said you cannot. It is an impossibility. It's either one or the other. See, so we were created to worship him. And one of the ways that we express his worthship, which is where we get the word worship, worthy ship, he is worthy of our worthy ship, worthship, you see. One of the ways that we do that is through music. What we just did here before uh, the study tonight, we worshiped him using music. Now, there's a problem. Music is very powerful. Music has a very powerful effect on the brain. And Satan knows that. Now, music is not immoral or moral. It's amoral. It's neutral. In other words, it's how that music is used. But did you know that Lucifer is worshipped vis-a-vis the music and entertainment of today because of the effect that music has on our brains. Do you know the only time you're using both sides of your brains is when you're uh, singing or when you're listening to music? Do you know that music has certain chords in concert with certain tempos and rhythms that actually unlock certain parts of the brain? News, uh, Newsweek, a number of years ago, did an article on, the music, uh, on music and the brain and said, scientists are finding that the human brain is pre-wired for music. You know, music's a drug. Music is so powerful, the effect that it has on our brain should never be underestimated. Now, factor in the fact that Lucifer was the angel of music, the worship leader in heaven, Uh, and he's staying with what he knows and wants to be worshipped. Do you realize that every time you go to a rock concert, well, not you, uh, the pagans, when they go and (laughs) worship at these, uh, you know, rituals, well, they're worshipping Satan. That's, That's how Satan receives the worship he's always wanted. When they're singing, when they're doing their worship music, only it doesn't glorify God, it glorifies Satan. Now, I I have to warn you that some of the material I'm about to uh, show you is going to be a little bit disturbing. But I have to, I have to say this. I have to say this. See, I think, like the Israelites, we can be guilty of worshiping demons. We can be guilty of worshiping Satan. And we don't even realize it. And it's through the medium of music. It is so powerful that you can become not a believer now, because I don't believe Christians can be demon-possessed, okay? 
you can be, as a Christian, with the Holy Spirit, you can be so demonically oppressed that it will manifest itself in the form of being possessed, but you're just oppressed, not possessed. But if you're not a believer and you don't have the Holy Spirit, music can be the avenue by which Satan can actually possess you and you will become demon-possessed. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. I realize that that raises a, f a few eyebrows. Uh, I can tell you from experience that before I came to Jesus Christ at age 19 in 1982, I was demon-possessed through the medium of music and drugs. Pharmakia, which the Bible uses that Greek word where we get pharmacy to describe witchcraft. See, when you're in an altered state uh, of, you know, uh, consciousness because of the drugs, you allow now Satan unfettered access into your soul, into your mind, into your body, and he will possess you. And I was demon-possessed. When I came to Jesus Christ, all of those demons left me, and the Holy Spirit indwelt me, and I was never the same again. And that was January 1982. Next year, uh, next year, well, next year and next month, January of 2010, uh, I will celebrate my 28th spiritual birthday. I look pretty good for 28, yeah? <laughs> no? Okay. So, but before that, I was so into the music. It was my life. And I realized that what I had done was I had allowed Satan to possess me. And he had my life. You know that uh, we, we, we have been told, oh, it's just a gimmick. You know, they sold their souls for rock and roll. That's true. That's true. See, Satan comes to these musicians and does what he basically offered to Jesus on a smaller scale and says, if you'll give me your soul, I'll give you all the money, all the fame, all the, you know, sex, all the everything you could possibly ever want if you'll just worship me and let me use you. See, God uses us as believers to further his kingdom. Satan uses his own to further his kingdom of darkness. Now, I'm going to quote for you from some pretty famous musicians. In their own words, documented, and you tell me if what I'm speaking to you is true or not. Okay? Little Richard. I was directed and commanded by another power. The power of darkness. The power of the devil, Satan. We must realize that there is a force that is fighting against us in the world. This is little Richard. The devil was controlling our minds, directing our lives. Jimi Hendrix. I can explain everything better through music. You hypnotize people. And when you get people at their weakest point, you can preach into the subconscious what you want to say. That's why the name Electric Church flashes in and out. Led Zeppelin. Holy of Holies. We'll talk about them more in a minute. From the song Houses of the Holy. Interesting song title. Let the music be your master. Won't you heed the master's call, O Satan? Tori Amos. I wanted to marry Lucifer. I don't consider Lucifer an evil force. I feel his presence with his music. His music. I feel like he comes and sits on my piano. David Bowie. Rock and roll has always been the devil's music. By the way, can I just, I'll, I'll finish a quote from him. Can I just uh, parenthetically uh, say this? Do not call Christian music Christian rock and roll, please. Because rock and roll is not a just, it has, a, it has its, 
it, the name, how do I say it's, it's, uh, I'm trying to be pastoral here. It, it, it has a very sexual connotation. I saw a bumper sticker. I was picking my boys up from school the other day. I saw a bumper sticker that said uh, Christian Rock. Or, or, or no, it said God Rocks. No. No. Jesus is my rock, but don't say Christian Rock and Roll. It has a, a very uh, pagan and very uh, demonic, uh, really, uh, and perverted uh, uh, meaning. David Bowie says, quote, Rock and roll has always been the devil's music. My overriding interest was in Kabbalah and Crowleyism. Crowleyism? I'll talk more about Aleister Crowley in just a moment. That whole dark and rather fearsome never world of the wrong side of the brain. I'm closer to the golden dawn immersed in Crowley's uniform. Hit Parader magazine reported that Bowie would light candles, draw pentagrams on his walls while casting hexes and spells. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. No, oh, some of you are gone. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I know some of you younger people are going, Jerry Lee who? <laughs> Quote, I have the devil in me. John Lennon. Quote, I've sold my soul to the devil. But my joy is when you're like possessed. This is John, John Lennon. Like a medium, you know. I'll be sitting around and it'll come in the middle of the night or at the time when you don't want to do it. That's the exciting part. I don't know who the expletive deleted wrote it. I'm just sitting here and the whole expletive deleted song comes out. So it, you're like driven and you find yourself over on a piano or a guitar and you put it down because it's been given to you or whatever it is that you tune into. The whole Beatle idea was do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt. Tom Cruise. Oh, no. <laughs> Pastor J.D., I hate you. <laughs> That's okay. I don't mind. Quote, I have gained a lot from Scientology. I know what it is and how it can help people from my own personal involvement and study of the subject. The one super secret sentence that Scientology is built on is, do as thou wilt, that is the whole of the law. What law? The satanic law. <laughs> Aleister Crowley was the teacher the master, the mentor of this law. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. He was a self-proclaimed Satanist. Wrote books on Satanism and how to worship Satan through music. He was the inspiration for a lot of the bands that you and I would call the best bands of all time. The Beatles. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Do you see the circle there? That is a picture of Aleister Crowley. Uh, Ringo Starr said, we want to put people on the Sgt. Pepper's album that we, quote, like and admire. Hit Parade, October 1976. Paul McCartney said of the St. 
uh, a saint, yeah, that's a, so far from it, Sergeant Pepper's cover, we were going to have photos on the wall of all our heroes. One of the Beatles' heroes included Aleister Crowley. Uh, most people, especially in 1967, did not even know who Crowley was, but the Beatles did. Uh, Crowley is believed to be Sergeant Pepper himself. Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. Personal testimony before God delivered me. I would go into a altered state of consciousness and listen for hours to Beatles music. And when I would sing, and I don't have a good voice, but when I would sing, I would sing perfectly as if it was another voice singing every word to every song verbatim. I knew it. And hours would go by. I didn't even realize how many hours had gone by. I was worshiping Satan through their music. They sold their soul for rock and roll. They sold their soul to the devil. Led Zeppelin, huge influence from Aleister Crowley. Uh, unbeknownst to most of us, much of the hellish music which they idolized was written and sang by devout followers of Crowley and his Satanist, uh, Satanism. Guitarist Jimmy Page, you have Jimmy P Page and Robert Plant, devout followers of Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley proclaimed himself as, quote, the beast, 666. In 1971, guitarist Jimmy Page bought Aleister Crowley's Bullskine house on the shore of the Loch Ness where Crowley practiced his satanic rituals, which included drinking blood. We just read that in Leviticus 17. Uh, human sacrifices. Uh, guitarist Jimmy Page actually performed Crowley magical rituals during their concerts. Uh, their song, Stairway to Heaven, arguably the most uh, popular song of all time. Very melodic, very hypnotic. You know, uh, oh, I was uh, walking to the office the other day and I, ha I heard, hear uh, heard this uh, you know, the, one of the, these uh, cars with those stereos that should, they should have a law against? You know what I'm talking about. The ones that when they pull up next to you, the whole, the whole your, car, your car vibrates. <laughs> I thought the first time that happened, I thought I had a flat tire. I thought, whoa, not again. My car is breaking down. It was the car next to me. It was four wheels with speakers on it. And <laughs> they're playing this song that, I mean, it's amazing to me because it's still, this music still has a powerful effect on me. I found myself as I'm walking back to the office, all of a sudden it was like, whoa, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was like, come here. <laughs> and he's buying stairway to hell. I mean, it just, oh my, I mean, oh, oh wait, oh Lord, I'm sorry. How about uh, the Beatles song? This one, will, this one used to get me all the time. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody now, hallelujah, Hare Krishna. See, music has a way of disarming you. It can so alter you and change you that you will be susceptible to and open to that which you would never otherwise be open to. Because it's so hypnotic, it is so powerful, and to this day, there are certain chords, they're called forbidden chords, I don't have time to get into that tonight, but that actually, uh, you know, will create the environment in your brain 
that unlocks the door between the conscience and, and, the, and the subconscious. And you, you couple that with the beat. Remember American Bandstand? I know I'm really dating myself now. Well, my dad used to watch it. No, I watched it. Dick Clark, that never ages. I don't know what that guy takes, but I'd like to get some of that. Uh, they would always interview, you know, the, you know, whenever they would introduce new music, they would say, what, what did you like about it? And without exception, they would say the beat. They would never say the words. You see, the beat will so entrance you. Hallelujah. You don't care what words you're singing. Because you've already been enveloped by and possessed by the power of that music. Stairway to heaven. There's a reference to the May Queen. Uh, this is a, uh, the May Queen comes from a poem that was written by Crowley. Uh, there's, uh, Jimmy Page had inscribed in the vinyl of their album, for you young people, vinyl is a record that they used to actually, it's like a small CD, only black. Okay, I just want to make sure you understood. So they would inscribe in the vinyl of their album, Led Zeppelin III, Crowley's famous words, do what thou wilt. That is the whole of the law. Page and Robert Plant claim some of Zeppelin's songs came via occultic automatic handwriting, including their song, Stairway to Heaven. Rolling Stone magazine quoted Jimmy Page as saying that, I told Robert to get a pen, and I started reciting the words to a song, and he wrote the words verbatim. We never changed one. We put it to music, and that song became Stairway to Heaven. I'm not going to get into the whole backwards masking thing, but I happen to believe it's true. Because see, in the subconscious, it's that subliminal uh, input. And if you play Stairway to Heaven backwards, it does say, I'm a little child of Satan. He will give you six, six, six. That's how it sounds backwards. And it's very clear. It's unmistakable. Now, why would you want to do it backwards? Well, Aleister Crowley taught to do everything backwards. Walk backwards. Sing backwards. You know, the, the, the Satan worshipers recite uh, a certain uh, passages backwards. Now, why, why back? You know, live, L-I-V-E, is evil, E-V-I-L, backwards. Now, when you do it subliminally, again, you'll accept something that you would never otherwise accept. If you came up to me and said, hey, J.D., I'm a little child of Satan. <laughs> he will give you 666. <laughs> I mean, listen, even before I'm a believer, I'm thinking, no way. <laughs> now, if you give me, give me a good beat... And a really melodic and hypnotic song. And start me off singing, Hallelujah. I'll sing anything you want. Oh, hey, Lucifer. See, if it's, if it's backwards, then my subconscious hears it. And it doesn't have to go through my conscience, which will reject it. You know, advertisers, and uh, they actually, they, do, they use subliminal advertising. They've proven that, you know, you go into a, a movie theater and they'll subliminally, just, have, just a flash of a millisecond, your subconscious sees popcorn, you go buy popcorn. They would play... Uh, in, in the music you hear in a grocery or, or, or a, you know, a department store, I'm, I will not shoplift. And shoplifting drops. I, w I will buy a Coke and popcorn and concession sales go up. That's how powerful it is. Just this subliminal advertising and the subliminal effect on the subconscious of the brain. But again, I'm not going to get into the science of that. But I'm of the school that it is true. It is absolutely true. 
Ozzy Osbourne called Aleister Crowley a phenomenon of his time. August 26, 1980, in Circus Magazine. Ozzy even had a song called Mr. Crowley. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It was dedicated to him. In the song, here's the words. You fooled all the people with magic. You waited on Satan's call. Mr. Crowley, won't you ride my white horse? Jim Morrison. On the back cover of the Doors 13 album, he and the other members of the Doors are shown posing with a bust of Aleister Crowley. Jim Morrison was quoted as saying, quote, that the souls or the ghost of those dead Indians, maybe one or two of them, were just running around freaking out and just leaped into my soul and they're still there. Michael Jackson. Quote, it's all of a sudden a magic from somewhere that comes and the spirit just hits you and you lose control of yourself. I wake up from dreams and go, wow, put this down on paper, automatic writing. The whole thing is strange. You hear the words, everything is right there in front of your face and you say to yourself, I'm sorry, I just didn't write this. It's there already. I feel that somewhere, someplace, it's all been done and I'm the courier bringing it into the world. Carlos Santana. Quote, I know it sounds new age, but in my meditation, this entity, which is called M M Metatron, which is a demonic uh, entity, he said, we want to hook you back to the radio airway frequency. We want you to reach junior high schools, high schools and universities. Once you reach them, because we are going to connect you with the best artists of the day, then we want you to present them a new menu. Let them know that they are themselves multidimensional spirits with enormous possibilities and opportunities. Sound like in the garden? You can be God. You have enormous possibilities and opportunities. We want you to present them with a new form of existence that transcends religion, politics, or the modest op operandi of education today. Uh, I have a whole other study that I've done on high school shootings. Without exception, every time a high school student takes a gun, goes to his school, and takes the life of fellow classmates or students and or teachers, it is without exception been inspired by the music that they listen to. Columbine, a whole documentary. Everything is documented down to the Nats eyebrow, without exception. Harris and Klebold, the two shooters, were demon-possessed because of the music that they listened to, which told them, kill the students, kill your parents. There's a, I have a, a documentary from this kid, this is a long time ago, killed his parents, then went and killed uh, a bunch of kids uh, at his school. And he was quoted as saying, in fact, it's so chilling because on the video, you hear his voice say, I, I, stop it. He's talking to the voices in his head. Stop it. I don't want to do that anymore. And he's weeping bitterly, uncontrollably because he, he killed his parents. And he's like, Mommy, I'm sorry, Daddy. He's a kid possessed by Satan through the music. It's not a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. Why do all of these bands have 666 and upside down crosses? Remember Blue Oyster Cult? Remember the upside down cross with the question mark? What do you think that's about? Nine Inch Nails. This is a, a newer band. Picture of a monkey hanging on a cross. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. And Lucifer hates my Jesus. And Lucifer hates me. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. You want to talk about a satanic group? Remember their song, Sympathy for the Devil? Oh, it's just a gimmick. Excuse me. No, Keith Richards and 
Uh, what's the main guy's name again with the lips? What's his name? Mick Jagger. Demon possessed. They sold their souls to Satan. Keith Richards, quote, The devil doesn't bother me. It's that God that me off. There's a demon in me. I've got four or five and we're all good friends. So I thought I'd just singularize it. It's like, uh, yeah, check yourself and he's still there in me. I've learned how to control him, I guess. And that's what the demon is about to do. Close quote, Keith Richards. Kurt Cobain, quote, I'll get stoned and worship Satan. Black Sabbath, 1976, two album uh, record titled, We Sold Our Souls for Rock and Roll. ACDC, they don't have to put anything backwards, it's all forwards. <laughs> I'm on the highway to hell. If God's on the left, then I'm sticking to the right. All my friends are going to be there too. Hell's bells. Every single one of these, this particular music. I was really into ACDC actually. I'm, I'm sorry to say, I have to confess. I was, this, their music with the hard pounding, you know, sound was, would just, I mean, it would, it had me. Uh, Angus Young was quoted as saying, by the time we're halfway through the first number, someone else is steering me. I'm just along for the ride. I become possessed when I get on stage. Alice Cooper claims to have received his name from a spirit by the same name at a seance. Cooper claimed that while performing, this spirit, quote, partly takes over his actions and singing on stage. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so sorry. Wish they all could be. <laughs> Brian Wilson. He hears voices. They talk to him. They distract him. They frighten him. They confuse him. Right now, as this creative genius behind the Beach Boys classic surf rock sound sits for an interview in his darkened living room, the Pacific crashing loudly outside his million-dollar Malibu home, the voices are calling. The 46-year-old screws up his face. His eyes roll toward the ceiling. They've gone blank. His brow is furrowed with thick worry lines. He is silent. He is gone. One interviewer wrote about him during an interview. Warner Brothers Records president Lenny Warrenker claims to have encountered at least five different entities that use Brian Wilson bodied as their home. Quote, there are a lot of different people there, says Warrenker. I have met five different people. It's not just music, it's movies. Sandra Bullock. She confesses to her witchcraft inclination. She says, it's almost like it's my conscience and my devil all in one. It's almost like I can read minds at this point. Instinct or intuition or a sixth sense that's like our gift. Oprah Winfrey. Uh, one called her America's pastor. She reaches more people in one day than a pastor will in a lifetime. Oprah Winfrey calls these her go there moments, spiritual episodes of divine guidance that far transcend the chatty exchanges with her studio audiences. Sometimes the epiphanies carry the voices of Negro slaves, Joe and Emily and Dara, Sue and Bess and Sarah. Winfrey says that she has come to know each of them personally and calls them in at will to guide her in her work. The spirits began visiting her a few years ago. Oprah freely confesses to demonic possession as a tool to enhance her influencing performances before the camera. She said, quote, I tried to empty myself and let the spirit of Seth inhabit me. 
Every morning before my scenes, I lit candles and said the names of these slaves. I prayed every day to the ancestors. Uh, I don't know if you, you might want to do a YouTube search for Oprah Winfrey. Uh, she denies Jesus Christ. She has a form of, of Christianity, uh, but it's not the same Jesus that you and I believe in and are trusting in. Uh, I want to recommend uh, some resources. You know, actually, uh, Martin and I had, um, uh, actually, Martin had provided a number of these, uh, copies of these DVDs uh, free of charge. We had placed them on the information table, and, of course, they, they were gone instantaneously. But one of them, and I don't recommend this for the faint at heart, it's called They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. It's a 10-hour documentary. And it will absolutely scare the hell out of you. Uh, when I was on the mainland in the pastorate there, uh, we would take this, it was only four hours then, this is a number of years ago, we would take it into uh, the prison ministry and we would show it to a pod of 20 uh, inmates at a time. And, and without exception, every single one of them would weep and come to Jesus Christ. It was the most powerful tool we ever had. That's the first time they'd ever heard that. And it deals with really the entertainment uh, industry as it relates to music. Uh, also, a Hollywood's War on God. Um, the uh, other, other ones they have are Hollywood Unmasked, and it's from uh, good F Fight the Good Fight Ministries. I think it's Fight the Good Fight. I think that it's on the screen there. Uh, goodfight.org. Uh, you can uh, go to their website and get that uh, CD, especially if you or someone you know uh, is involved in uh, the, these kinds of, uh, listening to this kind of music. Now, let me hasten to say that if the music you listen to and the movies you watch and the relationships you have draw you close to the Lord, then that's okay. Okay. But if the music you listen to and the movies you watch and the relationships you have draw you away from the Lord, then that's not okay. And that's really the litmus test. I mean, does this mean you only listen to Christian music? You know, I happen to really like some Hawaiian music. I love the ukulele uh, music and I love to listen. I love music. Always have. Music has always had a big part of my life even as a young child playing uh, uh, several different instruments. But the litmus test is, and, and some of these movies, you know, I'll, I'll watch. I do have a, what they call clear play DVD player that you download the uh, updates from the website. You subscribe to this membership and it edits all of the foul language and the sex scenes and the violence and the objectionable material so that you're watching a, without cannibalizing the, the movie. You can still enjoy the movie. So, I mean, there are some good movies out there with good themes, but sometimes they, they put certain things in there that I don't, I don't want to watch and I surely don't want my kids to watch. So we will put in the filter and it edits out uh, all of those scenes. And you can still enjoy the movie. And sometimes these secular movies can have a good, godly message. You know, it, so, some of the Christian music, can I just be really candid with you? Of course I can. I just said I would. So, <laughs> I think a lot of Christian music today does not glorify God. I think it glorifies man. I think it's self-focused. It's not worship. <laughs> oh, it's contemporary Christian music. I'll tell you, man, I, I listen to some of that music and I, I'm not edified. I feel my flesh rising up. Man, it's got a good beat. <laughs> I don't even know what kind of words I'm singing. And I want the music that I listen to to be... Vertical. I want it to be vertical from me to him. Because I want him to inhabit the praise that I have for him.
because he inhabits the praises of his people. We'll get into a little bit more of this, the difference between praise and worship when we study Leviticus 18, the next chapter, which will be not next Thursday, of course, because of Christmas Eve, but the following Thursday. I want to talk a little bit about worship. I think we don't have a clue what worship is. We don't, we think that, you know, this or that is worship. I, I, I got to say this, and I, I hate to say this. No, I don't. I want to say this. Am I arguing with myself? Yes, I am. <laughs> Maybe I'll win my argument. I don't know. God help us with Christian, contemporary Christian music. God help us. I wonder, you know, is it just to make money? Is it just to make, hey, you know, some non-believers have gotten into the contemporary Christian music market because there's more money there. These aren't Christians at all. Oh, we're cri- Case in point, Bono. Bono. Don't look at me like that. You know who he is. You too. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Everybody now. Bono. Oh, I thought he was a Christian. You know, there is a quote from him. You can see it on YouTube. We did that just to deceive the Christians. Bono is demon possessed, he is not a Christian. He worships Satan, and he's deceiving Christians. Don't be ignorant, please. I hear of a church that offers his book in their bookstore. God help us. God have mercy on us. This is how I came to Christ. I saw a program about the satanic influence in rock and roll music and it literally scared the hell out of me. And I went into my room and I closed the door while my roommates were still out there partying and I cried out to God. I was so drunk and I was so stoned and I said, Jesus, I don't want to go on the highway to hell anymore. I want to go to heaven. What do I need to do? And I fell asleep praying. And I woke up the next day and I was a new creature in Jesus Christ. I couldn't start my day without drugs and drink and music. And I went to reach for that beer in the fridge in the morning for breakfast. And the Holy Spirit said, you don't need that anymore. I went for that bong to take a bong hit. You don't need that anymore. I went for the Beatles album to play on the stereo The Holy Spirit said, you don't need that anymore. And I never looked back. And that was 28 years ago. Satan had me. And I was on my way to hell. And Jesus saved me. Because of the power that the music had on me. I want to close with a verse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth by the Holy Spirit and says, verse 20, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. My fear is, I'm not trying to bash the church, but I wonder, are we the Laodicean church? Are we that lukewarm church? neither hot nor cold, that God has to vomit out of his mouth. The church that Jesus is on the outside of, standing at the door knocking, asking to come in and sup with us and us with him. Jesus isn't even in the church because the church is so lukewarm.
Are we participating in this? You cannot participate in this and worship the Lord. You got to either be hot or cold. Jesus said, I wish you were either hot or cold. You cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in, in the Lord. You cannot do that. That is a miserable existence, isn't it? You got just enough of the Lord in you to be miserable in the world, and you got just enough of the world in you to be miserable in the Lord. That's not a whole life, and that's not a holy life. What's the theme of Leviticus? Holiness. Be holy as I am holy. Don't be half. Don't be a third. Be whole. Be whole. Because I'm holy. And I want you to worship me this way. I don't want you to worship as the world, as Egypt worships. I don't want you to participate in the practices of worshiping these gods that the world has created in their own image. This is how I want to be worshipped. This is where I want to be worshipped. This is the way I want to be worshipped. Don't worship demons. Don't participate in those kinds of practices. Don't drink from that cup. Maybe you're here tonight and the Lord's just really maybe searching your heart about some of the entertainment that you've allowed into your home, some of the music you've allowed onto your iPod. Maybe he needs to put his finger on it and, and say, you know, no, I don't want you participating in that. I don't want you listening to that. I don't want you watching that. I don't want you buying that. Why don't you all stand? Father, we're sobered. Maybe even stunned. And Lord, that's a good thing. Lord, I would just ask that you would take this study in Leviticus 17 and all that we've seen here tonight as difficult as maybe it's been to try to get our minds around it and upsetting perhaps, but Lord, maybe it's your way of saying like you said to the Israelites then, you're saying to us now, this is how I want you to worship me. I don't want you to worship like that anymore. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. We want to worship you in a way that glorifies you and brings honor to you. Forgive us, Lord, for how the world has crept in and caused us to be like this. Lord, forgive us for trying to look too much like the world or be too much like the world. Lord, you want us to be a peculiar people, set apart, sanctified, holy unto you. If you're here tonight and you just need to repent, would you do that? Would you just ask the Lord to forgive you and remove from you anything that